the comments for episode 135, Thomas Malu asked for an episode about a site in India where there's a major deposit of jarosite. That's an interesting topic for me, because my research focus for several years has involved smectite, which has some associations with jarosite. But what is jarosite, and why is it so interesting? Jarosite is a family of minerals usually found in acidic, sulphur-rich conditions. It commonly forms in sulphide ore deposits. One of its identifying features is the presence of iron, Fe, and sulphate, SO4. It has the very useful property of being able to grab hold of some very nasty poisons like lead and arsenic and some troublesome contaminants in useful metals like zinc. It also has uses in construction materials. It's so useful that it's now being commercially manufactured. There are two ways to make it. It can be made by purely chemical reactions, or it can be produced by bacteria. There's a marked difference in texture between the two. Chemical reactions produce coarse-grained, large units, whereas bacteria produce fine-grained, smaller units. The kind produced by bacteria tends to be more efficient. Well, that's all very nice, but why has jarosite suddenly become a trendy topic? NASA sent probes to Mars and landed five Mars rovers. Three of those rovers came across jarosite. Some of the deposits were ten feet thick. One rover, called Spirit, got stuck in a layer of jarosite hidden under a thin layer of wind-blown sand. NASA tried to get it unstuck. But jarosite has very low cohesion. Over several weeks, they made many attempts, but each one led to it sinking deeper until its belly settled onto the sand. NASA gave up. Spirit had to be abandoned. Its twin rover, called Opportunity, also got stuck at a different location. But the engineers back at NASA worked for five weeks on it and eventually managed to get it unstuck. It carried on working until it ran out of power a few years later in a four-month-long dust storm that blocked the sunlight from its solar panels. And now, India is close to launching a new Mars rover. Everybody's concerned about the possibility of it perishing in jarosite as Spirit did, and as Opportunity nearly did. So, it's proposed to make a site where Mars exploration equipment can be tried out. At the jarosite deposits which Thomas indicated in Kutch, Gujarat, in India. They're hoping the new rover will give some indication of life on Mars. They're also talking about jarosite being a good indicator of Martian geology and comparing it with Earth's geology. And that, of course, brings in those fabulous millions of years the geologists love so much. The geology of Mars is much simpler than Earth's geology. It has only three geological epochs. They're called the Noachian, the Hesperian and the Amazonian. The majority of Earth's geology comes from deposits laid down in Noah's flood. But, as we saw in episode 23, Charles Lyell and his enlightened disciples 
denied the fact of Noah's flood. Like all Enlightenment atheists, they hate the idea of the flood, a judgment from God on rampant sin. Lyle put forward his completely unsubstantiated uniformity hypothesis, which claims that as far back in time as we can go, all geological processes have proceeded at the same rate as they do today. As we saw in episode 24, Lyle combined this with his equally unsubstantiating claim that sediments have always been laid down at one-eighth of an inch a century. So he was able to claim that the first sediments must have been deposited 600 million years ago. And just about everybody, especially geologists, believe it, or pretend to believe it, today. By using guesses, assumptions and wishful thinking, they've pushed the age of the Earth back much further than that. It's now more than four billion years old. We saw in episode 30 to 32 that the best evidence we have is that Noah's flood began when the Earth was struck by a 200 kilometre diameter meteorite. This appears to have been part of a cloud of meteorites which swept through the solar system about four and a half thousand years ago, leaving many craters on the planets and on the moon. There are some craters on Earth which may have been caused by late stragglers in that cloud of meteorites. Looking into all this gave me an opportunity to see if Google's AI bot is any different to those we looked at in episode 134. It turned out to be pretty much the same. I asked, what evidence is there for a meteorite cloud passing through the solar system? It told me that was not a scientifically recognised concept, but there is evidence for a dust cloud. As with the others, I then started to ask relevant questions. I asked about the widely accepted evidence for a cloud of meteorites leaving craters on the moon and planets. It then admitted the late heavy bombardment, but assured me that the existence of a short-lived cataclysmic spike is still debated by some scientists. With just a little more pushing, it admitted that it considered the most compelling evidence was the samples brought back from the moon by the Apollo astronauts in the late 1960s and early 1970s. They showed a surprisingly tight clustering of ages around 3.9 billion years ago, which suggested that a large number of impacts occurred within a relatively short period. Well, of course, as we saw in episode 28, those billions of years are speculation which is absolutely essential for the Enlightenment atheist's belief system. But the evidence put forward by George Dodwell, which we look at in episode 30 and 31, put the event at about four and a half thousand years ago, nowhere near 3.9 billion years ago. So, getting back to Mars, there are only three eras or epochs on Mars. The oldest is the Noachian. Do you find it surprising that it's named after Noah? And how is this epoch of Noah defined? It's a time of rapid, frequent and large meteorite impacts which severely battered the planet. And guess what age is ascribed to the time of this sudden deluge of large meteorites? 
3.9 billion years, the same time as the Earth was supposed to be hit by the 200 kilometer meteorite which Dodwell showed in episode 31, actually struck about four and a half thousand years ago. That 200 kilometer meteorite impact caused the enormous upheaval and the spectacular flood which Lyle's geology denies ever happened. It caused enormous earthquakes, vast outpourings of lava, and so much sediment that Lyle could claim its deposition took 600 million years instead of the one year that the Bible tells us about. And on Mars, there were major local floods, huge volcanic eruptions, and extensive lava flows. Isn't that interesting? Where did that water come from and where did it go to? Since there's no water on the surface of Mars now. On Earth, the Bible tells us where the water for Noah's flood came from. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. For many years, I've been persuaded that Walt Brown's assessment was right. There were large reservoirs of water under a thick blanket of basalt. For about one and a half thousand years, those reservoirs fed the fountains from which there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. But when all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, water jetted up around the edges of the broken basalt plates. Under the pressure of several miles of rock, the water spurted out at great speed over the period of 40 days and 40 nights. It flooded the whole earth. It looks as if God might have made Mars with a similar kind of structure. Large reservoirs of water under a few miles of basalt. After the meteorite bombardment, the Earth's crust was broken into plates which moved around, powered by the energy of the 200 kilometer diameter meteorite, pushing up mountain ranges very quickly, as we saw in episode 36. But the crust of Mars was not broken up into continental plates. Perhaps none of the many large meteorites which struck Mars were as enormous as 200 kilometers in diameter. But there was a major pouring out of water, basalt and volcanic lava, and that leads to the second era of Martian history. The Hesperian, which is characterized by lava plains and far fewer meteorite craters. The third era, the Amazonian, which has few craters, but a varied topography, is the current epoch. But there's a question about where the flood waters went to. As far as the Earth goes, we are told the waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains they go down by the valleys, unto the place which thou hast founded for them. And presumably much of it went into the amazingly deep ocean trenches, which may be the collapsed remnants of former subterranean reservoirs, which now have water on top of the collapsed basalt roof instead of below it. Where the Martian water went to, nobody knows. 
Mars is now a dusty red desert. Could it be that the water reacted with chemicals like iron and sulphides to make rust, jarosite, and other such compounds? Could there be aspects of the structure of Mars which we have no clue about? Oh, the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, and who hath been his counsellor? Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.